Hello, everybody, and welcome to Avna Pancreatic Cancer Foundation's very first Empower Ed webinar, Advances in Pancreatic Cancer Research. My name is Sophia Kasbolt, and I'm the Programmers Manager at Avna Foundation, and thank you so much for joining us today. Now, I just have a little bit of housekeeping. Oh, that's the, not the right slide. <laughs> just a little bit of housekeeping to go through um, before we start today. And I just need to let you know that um, the information presented in these webinars is of a general nature and shouldn't be considered personal or medical advice. Always seek independent advice relevant to your specific situation. Tonight, the opinions of the presenters are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Avner Foundation. If you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar, please do let us know via the Q&A chat bar on the right of the screen or email me at sophia at avnersfoundation.org.au and we'll do our best to help you sort these out. A recording of the webinar will be available after tonight and only those presenting on screen will be recorded. During the webinar, the attendees' mics and camera will be off. So I'd just like to take you through quickly a little bit about what to, tonight will hold. And it will include three presentations, each followed by a brief Q&A. Please send through your questions at any time via the Q&A panel on the right. And if a question comes through that you also want answered, you can upvote it in the chat. Questions most relevant to today's topic or more general in nature will be prioritised. So if you have any questions specific to your circumstances, these are really best directed to your healthcare team. All right, so now that I've got that out of the way, I'd really like to extend a very warm welcome to our presenters for this evening. We have Associate Professor Nick Pavlakis, Amber Johns and Professor John Salzberg. Up first, we'll have Associate Professor Nick Pavlakis, who will give us an overview of advances in pancreatic cancer research with a focus on clinical research. Dr. Pavlakis is a medical oncologist with over 20 years of experience in the field of oncology, clinical and translational research with a special interest in the development of new cancer drugs. He is the current president of the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia and practices at Royal North Shore Hospital, Genesis Care, and North Shore Private Hospital, Sydney. Next up, we'll have Amber Johns, who will discuss how the Australian Pancreatic Cancer Genome Initiative is helping uncover the genetics of pancreatic cancer. Amber Johns is an oncology researcher at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research and project manager for the Australian Pancreatic Cancer Genome Initiative. Amber's research experience has focused on establishing and coordinating the development of complex, novel, large-scale research projects. Amber has clinical experience in pathology and cytology and has been instrumental in building the Australian Pancreatic Cancer Genome Initiative, which is also part of Australia's contribution to the International Cancer Genome Consortium. And finally, this evening, we'll have Professor John Zalkberg, who will discuss how Australian clinical quality registries are improving care and treatment with a focus on pancreatic cancer. Professor Zalkberg is currently the head of the Cancer Research Program, as well as NHMRC Practitioner Fellow in the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at Monash University, currently overseeing the establishment and activities of clinical quality registries across various tumour types. He's also the inaugural Tony Charlton Chair of Oncology at Alfred Health. He is the current chair of the Australian Clinical Trials Alliance and co-chair of the COSA Trial Initiative. He is immediate past chair of the board of the Australian Gastrointestinal Trials Group after serving in this role for over 15 years. He is a past board member of Cancer Trials Australia, past board member of the New South Wales Cancer Institute and past president of the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia. Now we know that traditionally pancreatic cancer has been difficult to treat, but it'll be great to hear tonight about the advances that have been made and where research is headed. Now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Pavlakis for his presentation. And uh, Dr. Pavlakis, if you just want to turn on your webcam and mic, we can see you present. Thank you.
to uh, present, an, uh, I guess, an overview of where we're heading with, with search, how we've come to where we are and where we're going to next. And I would like to say in my disclosures that I was previously on the Scientific Review Board for the Avna Grants as well. So pancreas cancer, as we know, affects nearly 4,000 patients um, a year um, in Australia, of which a significant proportion, unfortunately, die of the disease. And a, a five-year mortality is just under 11%, figures that would no doubt all agree are not good enough. And that figure was less than 10%. So we've made a 1% gain in the last dec in the last two decades. If we look at incidence, pancreas cancer is the eighth most common malignancy, but the third most common cause of cancer-related deaths, and that's increasing. If you look on the left, on the bottom, you'll see a slowly rising incidence rate um, over the last two, 20 years. And on the bottom, on the right, you'll see there's been a slight increase since 2007, a slight increase in the five-year overall uh, survival rate for this disease. So clearly there needs to be improvement. So um, who gets pancreas cancer and how can you get it? 90 to 95% of cases are what we call sporadic or out of the blue. There are some lifetime, lifestyle factors that increase your risk. And only 5 to 10% of pancreas cancers are associated with a, a hereditary a genetic uh, identifiable alteration. And why have the outcomes been so poor and why has it been such a challenge? These schematics are purely there to demonstrate one of the complexities of the disease, and that is the anatomical location of where the disease is. You'll see on the left, which indicates a patient facing forwards where the pancreas lies, and it, you, what's not visible there is the back and the um, skeleton that um, is present um, before that. And on the right-hand side is a cross-section taken horizontally across the patient, which shows you the pancreas colored in orange, and it's a deep organ interrelated to the liver, blood vessels, and sitting between uh, the liver in the middle of the abdominal region uh, before the back uh, uh, and spinal processes. And if we look at the slide on the left here, uh, when you look in even closer detail, you see how more complex the interrelationship is of the pancreas with its adjacent structures. And the two things I like to highlight there are the superior mesenteric vein and artery, which go right in between the pancreas wrapping itself around there. And they are important structures when it comes to determining if a pancreas cancer can be removed surgically because it needs to be separated from those structures. And on the right is a view under the microscope uh, showing a dense uh, 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 tissue uh, that's the sort of lightly colored pink tissue that's there, which we call a desmoplastic reaction that's thought to be one of the factors contributing to the failure of drugs to get into the and penetrate into the pancreas for adequate act action. That's only one of the mechanisms of resistance. So we're going to talk about research today, and I want to talk to you about broad uh, categories of research. I'll talk about discovery research, uh, where we're seeking for that eureka moment, that hallelujah effect of fantastic and big impact, and then the small incremental gains that come from structured research, where you build on what you've learned from before. Uh, and that includes laboratory-based research, and you'll hear from Amber Johns about the, uh, um, the leading research that's being undertaken at APKI, and where we try to understand the biology of the disease, trying to identify new drug targets and understand why treatments may or may not be working. And in the clinic and in the translational laboratory, we're evaluating the new therapies. We're doing that through clinical trials. I'll talk to you a little bit about those. And we're identifying prognostic and predictive markers that may help direct us to develop the best therapy for a particular patient. I want to also briefly introduce the theme of outcomes research. This uh, will be touched on by Professor Zalsberg. Um, and this also includes research evaluating the success and failures in real world data and registries and in, and in uh, institutional databases and allows you to look at what you've done and what's worked and what hasn't worked. It allows you to improve on existing therapies within your own population and also identify areas of improvement within systems um, and broad categories of healthcare. So in terms of clinical trials, we have phase one to four clinical trials. A phase one trial takes a drug from the laboratory, trying to determine what's the right dose for the patient. A phase two trial will take that recommended dose in a particular population. And we'll talk about pancreas cancer here. It'll identify a group of pancreas patients 
who may or may not have had previous treatment and see if the drug has some activity relative to what other drugs have done similarly in the past. And then in phase three, you're testing that drug that you think is promising against the standard of care, either on its own or in combination, to try to develop uh, or improve upon what is our existing standard of care, and that's what then will change our practice. Phase four trials basically is when the trial has been registered and we're now looking at learning more about the data in broader populations or in other unique populations. So have we made an impact in this disease through our research? And I'd say the, 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 the simple answer is yes, but it's been in small incremental steps. And that has involved largely all facets of care. For surgery, uh, our steps have been in reduction in mortality and morbidity from the operations. Um, and that has largely been around expertise in, surg in surgery and in the specialised centres and the after-surgical care that is required to get three people through these operations. Uh, we talk about multidisciplinary teams briefly. There's been improvements in chemotherapy, but I'll show you. And, and in patients who have uh, cancer that can be surgically removed, we know that the addition of chemo as a package uh, improves the likelihood of survival without recurrence with three times as many people alive and well who've undergone chemo and surgery as opposed to surgery alone. I want you to look at the little drawing on the right. I've actually clicked it already, um, but I want you to have a look. I, I was going to show you that's that's actually the anatomy of what happens to you after a Whipple's procedure. And it demonstrates why many patients after an operation struggle to recover and need a lot of support uh, through um, um, the hospital and dietitians, etc., just to regain their strength. So let's talk about one eureka moment of the past. And this might seem quite a, a minor one today, but it was a landmark uh, moment in pancreas cancer research back in the 1990s. And it involved this small paper, somewhat innocuous paper, comparing a new drug, gemcitabine, against an old transit to see if it was active. And this was actually a randomized phase two trial. And it was published around the time I was still a registrar, and it was not long after that it got approved on the basis of this small trial. But what was pivotal about this trial was it demonstrated uh, a clinical benefit of chemotherapy with gemcitabine in reduction in pain, reduction in the use of analgesia, improvement in the patient's fitness, and improved on maintenance of weight. And quite surprisingly, and that was the primary endpoint of the study, but surprisingly, the survival observed was nearly 20% at one year versus 2%. And on the basis of that small study, gemcitabine became accepted as a standard therapy. And since that time, we've gone on to build on that, but it's taken many years from 1997 to 2013 where the next major breakthrough in a positive clinical trial was reported that has now defined our standard of care. And that is with the gemcitabine, a Braxane combination. And you can see uh, there that the survivorship at one year is twofold what it was with gemcitabine alone. Another uh, gain was with the combination Fulfirinox, which was 48% one year survival compared to before. But there were many trials in between that period, some of which were statistically positive, but never made it to change practice. And what that means is they obviously had a benefit in certain subgroups of patients, but not enough to have an overall population effect to make the POSI significantly positive to justify therapy. So what that tells us is that really what we need to do is identify what the best treatment is for a particular patient in order to get the best outcome for that patient. That brings us to the concept of personalized therapy. And this schematic identifies that. If you look at all the patients in the blue box, um, and that is your population, that uh, if you're using a trial design, everyone gets the same treatment. But yet we know within that population, there are some people, the yellow, who just won't respond to the treatment. There are those patients with red, for example, who may respond, but who get quite a lot of toxicity. So you want to separate those out. And then there's those in the blue who are probably going to gain the best with the best balance of um, efficacy and toxicity. So how do we pick those patients in amongst the population? We need to find predictive factors. And there's two types of factors we look at uh, biologically. One is what we call a prognostic factor that says that the factor predicts for better outcome for a patient, regardless of whatever treatment they have. And that's a nice thing to know a patient when you see them and you're discussing prognosis. But then there's a predictive factor that says if you have this particular factor, then a particular treatment is more likely to benefit you than something else. And that is where we start to look at tailoring therapies. 
So speaking of um, tailored therapy or targeted therapy, last year this particular publication came out, which was probably the first of the modern era uh, um, uh, targeted agents in pancreas cancer. And this looked at um, olaparib, which is a drug that's used in um, BRCA mutated patients with ovarian and breast cancer. It's under the class of what we call a PARP inhibitor. And, and it works in patients, it was expected to work in patients uh, with pancreas carry, uh, cancer carrying this BRCA mutation. And so what this trial did is um, it, evalu it screened patients for the presence of this mutation. And you can see that it required over 3,300 patients to be screened to find the 247 patients who had the mutation of which 154 entered the trial. And this took quite a lot of work. Unfortunately, in our study, we, we participated in the study and we weren't able to find a suitable patient at the time at North Shore. And it took patients who had previous chemotherapy involving a platinum agent and it gave them the oral drug olaparib or a placebo to see if we could suppress the uh, recurrence or progression of the cancer. And at 24 months, 22% of the patients who had the treatment still had no evidence of a progression of their disease as opposed to the placebo, which was quite a landmark finding and a significant step forward for that small subgroup of patients who had this disease. Whilst I've talked about med all the changes I've talked about so far is in people with advanced or metastatic disease, but most of these improvements have also been carried forward into early pancreas cancer. And we know chemotherapy improves survival in the early setting with the addition of chemotherapy. And if you go down the line on the left-hand side, you'll see that more chemotherapy seems to be better as you go down, but more chemotherapy carries more toxicity. So it's not suitable for all patients. So what we've discovered is that giving the treatment before surgery, we so-called neoadjuvant therapy, uh, allows us to treat more patients and, and, and hopefully offer them the benefit that chemotherapy can afford uh, when they're not able to tolerate it postoperatively. And we know that chemotherapy is better tolerated preoperatively. It has advantages in that it may shrink the tumour and facilitate more effective and less risky surgery, leading to a more complete operation. It may prevent an operation that otherwise wouldn't have been of value if a patient relapses early afterwards. And it allows us to also apply modern techniques of radiotherapy, such as SBRT. And SBRT is a technique called stereotactic body radiation therapy, which is a very focused method of delivering um, radiotherapy. But it does require you to know your target. And if you look at the drawing in the middle, you'll see the white uh, marks uh, in the middle, which represent a landmark to identify the tumour. If you don't have that, it sometimes can be difficult. But the reason I want to highlight that is you can actually implant within the tumour markers that show up on a CT so that you can identify the landmark to do the treatment. So what are some ongoing areas of research? There's research into, into directly injecting therapies into tumours with drugs or radioactive particles. And there's a trial recently conducted around Australia uh, with that uh, done through an endoscopy procedure. There are new radiation techniques besides the SBRT. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, gamma knife and proton therapy in development. There are new drug therapies, and I'll talk briefly about immunotherapy. And I've touched already on the concept of targeted therapies that are specific to uh, specific subtypes of the cancer. So let's talk briefly about immune therapy. Everyone's probably heard about this. And the immune therapy that I'm referring to here will be the checkpoint inhibitors that are in widespread use in melanoma, lung cancer, bladder cancer, and many other tumor types. And these uh, work on the principle that they unlock the evasive uh, capacity of the tumour to hide itself from um, exposure to the immune cells. Um, and that's been shown to be quite effective in a number of tumour types. Unfortunately, the early studies conducted in pancreas cancer have not shown similar activity. And there are a variety of reasons that I'll summarize briefly by saying it may have to do with the complexity of the microenvironment in the pancreas tumor. But a hopeful observation was seen for a small group of patients with pancreas cancer who have a particular uh, characteristic to their tumor, which we call mismatch repair or microsatellite instability. And that same characteristic 
diagnostic, if it's present in patients with gastric cancer or colorectal cancer, also predicts that immune therapy may work in those patients. And what we saw in a small group of patients in this trial reported recently was up to 20% of patients had major tumor shrinkage and one patient had complete resolution of the tumor on the scan. And that patient still has ongoing uh, response. And there are research studies going on combining immunotherapy, trying to get an effect in the broader population, trying to overcome this immune resistance that is innate to a majority of the patients. So what are we doing at my hospital? Uh, in my hospital uh, at North Shore, uh, which uh, we consider to be a pancreas center, we have uh, expert pathology reporting that pathologists led uh, synoptic reporting of uh, uh, removal of the uh, pancreas cancers. We've uh, evolved into the area of neoadjuvant therapy and are reviewing our data to uh, present our retrospective data, but we now have a prospective protocol and are participating in a clinical trial that I'll show you. We've uh, been using SBRT with the application of markers to identify this, and we have a trial running in that setting. And we have a laboratory that's evaluating um, predictive and prognostic factors, as well as having undertaken some research in new therapies, one of which was uh, an innovative grant from Adna Foundation several years ago now. Um, in our publication of our research, you'll see here, we've seen our survivorship compares favorably compared to the average statistics across New South Wales, the UK and the US in both our, all our patients and in the, those patients who undertook surgery alone. And um, we feel the reason why we're able to produce good outcomes is because we have a quite a coordinated multidisciplinary team. We have a pancreas specific meeting held every two weeks and we have expertise in a variety of settings to try to assist patients uh, either to proceed to surgery or even to avoid complications related to the disease, such as blockage of bile ducts um, and facilitate uh, uh, various therapies along the journey of patients with pancreas cancer. This is an example of some selected trials going on around Australia and two that we're conducting. This is led by uh, Dr. Andrew Orr and a colleague of mine from Lornish Hospital, Andrew Kneebone. It's the master plan trial. It received MRFF uh, grant funding from the Australian government in 2018. It's evaluating the addition of SBRT radiotherapy in patients who've had preoperative uh, fulfirinox or gemcitabine-based chemotherapy, um, and then evaluating following surgery, uh, or if they're not possible to not have surgery, really whether the addition of SBRT can reduce the likelihood of local recurrence in this disease, which we know is a significant factor. And that study has started enrolling, and we're about to put our first patient on the study at the moment. Um, and this is another study I'd like to draw your attention to. It's led by a colleague of ours, Peter Gibbs, and his colleague, Jenny Tai from uh, Melbourne. Uh, um, and um, it um, is evaluating the use of circulating tumor DNA um, in patients um, who have had surgery to try to determine the degree of chemotherapy um, intensity that they should undertake and to see if we can tailor the treatment according to what's found in the blood test. And that's a very important study. Similar studies also being undertaken in uh, colorectal cancer. So I'll summarize by saying that there has certainly been advances through uh, research, uh, and most of the progress, unfortunately, has been incremental. Um, it's arisen out of a work undertaken by groups such, such as APKI and others in enhancing our biologic understanding of the disease. It's involved laboratory research and a multitude of clinical trials. Um, unfor it's unfortunate that most of our improvements have uh, involved what I call the sledgehammer effect of more is better. Uh, and, but in order to give some complex therapies to patients, we have to be better at protecting the patient. And that comes with supportive care and a multidisciplinary team. Uh, but unfortunately, not all patients are able to tolerate these more intensive therapies. So we do need to identify uh, the more specific therapies for patients. And ongoing areas of research that I think are essential to improve survival are still uh, the area of early detection, as hard as it may be, because uh, in pancreas cancer, we do know that early stage tumors do still do better. 
more importantly to the majority of patients that may never present early is identifying specific therapies that give us greater magnitude of benefit with less toxicity, and that's with the use of biomarkers. And we do need to keep searching for that new trial, and we still need to keep looking for that next eureka moment. And I think if you look historically from to 1997 to now, I think we're ready for another one. So I'm hopeful uh, for the future. I think perseverance does pay off, and I can say that having been in this area now since 1997 with that gemcitabine trial, I, I, and encourage you all to remain hopeful, seek a trial if you can, uh, because within the clinical trials, we're trying to evaluate how to make things better. Thank you. So um, there are some questions that have been posed, um, and I'm happy to answer those briefly before we move on. Um, Question is from Charlene Gates, uh, do all patients currently have access to targeted therapy? The answer to that is no. Targeted therapy requires you to have a target and be able to identify it. And there's still a lot of work to be done in pancreas cancer because uh, one of the commonest genetic uh, findings is to a mutation that doesn't lend itself yet to targeted therapy. Um, but uh, with ongoing research, I think we'll see a breakthrough. And I think we just got to keep persevering. Um, the other question is in regards to um, whether if chemotherapy, if, if a cancer comes back, what can be done second round? Um, now, there are trials in this, that have demonstrated the benefit in the second line setting, and there are standards of care available in Australia, the Folfox chemotherapy and the liposomal renotecan chemotherapy. But a lot of clinical trials are being conducted in that space, so I think it is important to look to see if there's a trial evaluating some of these new therapies that are looking very promising. Um, Another question is around, um, are there any statistics for gemcitabine or Braxane returning to being effective after initial successful therapy? Um, Rechallenge is difficult. Uh, Abraxane has a limiting uh, side effect of neuropathy. And sometimes you might stop the Abraxane because you've reached that point uh, only to leave a patient on gemcitabine and find that the cancer starts to appear again. You'd like to rechallenge with the Abraxane, but that's only feasible if um, the neuropathy has resolved. So it's complicated. I think um, I think uh, it's important that um, to allow yourself to have the benefit of extra therapy, your patient's got to remain fit and well and as active as can be. I think mobility is important, um, but it's a difficult disease that ha has an overwhelming malaise and effect on patients. And so I think... Um, 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 you can only do what you can do in some patients. I think it's important if, to take a family history in patients to determine if they could be carrying one of these um, mutations that may lend themselves to targeted therapy. And, the, and that testing is available for BRCA for the possibility of access to drugs such as Olaparib. I might stop there because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, talks to go through with the rest of my colleagues. Uh, if there are no other questions, then. Dr. Pavlakis, we really appreciate that. Um, there was just one question I wanted to add, if that's all right, and that's um, how do people best access clinical trials? So most of the centres that conduct, uh, uh, offer chemotherapy uh, do conduct clinical trials. I think it's important to ask if your centre is participating in trials and then specifically trials related to pancreas cancer. Not all centres that offer chemotherapy will have trials specific to pancreas cancer because they may not see enough cases to justify the trials. So it's important that you seek the help of your oncologist. There are uh, websites and there are apps that we use to identify trials in our local or metropolitan area that we may refer patients to. And I think all of us have a duty of care to seek what's best for the patient. Um, um, so you, there is a, there are um, the Australasian Gastrointestinal Trials Group. I presented two trials of theirs and that website shows you which sites are uh, um, conducting that trial. And there are, um, as I said, uh, apps that actually can identify centres that are conducting clinical trials in pancreas research. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your presentation. I, I know you have to um, run off to your MDT soon as well, but we really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. And um, now I'm going to hand over to Amber Johns to talk about the Australian Pancreatic Cancer Genome Initiative. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. I'm just going to share my slides from here. So bear with me while I boot them up. Are we all good to go? We have a home screen. Yes. Okay. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Um, it's great for you all to get together to hear a little bit about pancreatic cancer research. And I'm going to talk to you now about the genomics of pancreatic cancer. So I've already had a little introduction. So, um, our story at the APGI is really about the connection between cancer and DNA. And cancer is really a disease of the DNA because our DNA is the chemical carrying instructions that tell cells what to do. And then when those instructions have mistakes, cells may not function normally, including growing out of control to cause cancer. So basically cancer is arising through the accumulation of this genetic damage. So hi. these cancer causing changes, hello. Hi, sorry, sorry, Amber. We just can't see your slides right now. It's, um, it hasn't loaded. Oh, okay. That's... Ah, there we go, um, yep. I'm sharing my screen. Yep, we can see them now. They're just coming up. Is that there now? Um, yep, I can see your whole screen now. So okay. I think it's just a, a few seconds behind. Oh, okay, no worries. Just let me know if I'm going too fast. Okay, so, and we've really seen uh, a revolution in the era um, of genomics and the study of DNA in cancer, um, including some really massive rapid technological advance. So we have this increased capacity with decreased cost um, and what took years now really just takes days. And you can see in a little GIF there, a robotic arm that's moving samples um, onto a, a, a genome sequencer. And this is really how uh, many labs around the world are, are operating now. So the problem, and Nick has already alluded to this um, in uh, his talk earlier about the problem in cancer. And this is not explicit to pancreatic cancer. This is really many cancers in general. Uh, and the problem that we know each cancer is different, but we treat them largely the same. Uh, and a major challenge is, is, is that we don't have the information to know ahead of time which treatments will work and which won't. Um, and it really means that we're either over-treating or under-treating cancers, or we have very few meaningful treatments at all which is often, unfortunately, the case in pancreatic cancer. But also, we'll never find the answers if we don't ask the right questions. And this is something that the APGI was formed to, to work to address. And in 2009, the APGI came together um, as really a new way of working. It was uh, following a new idea um, around the idea of team science and, and getting a large group of people to work together towards a common goal um, when the goal was really something bigger than their own individual research project. And, and the APGI has now evolved into a global research enterprise, really. We have over a hundred members uh, consisting of scientists, clinicians, allied health professionals uh, involved in pancreatic cancer research and care. And the idea initially uh, was to look at the underlying biology of pancreatic cancer. And we knew we needed a large team of people to do this. And we wanted to apply these new genome sequencing technologies to pancreatic cancer. We wanted to identify all the changes in order to better understand the different forms of cancer and to find new ways to control them. We also wanted to make the data freely available to the research community for ongoing work. And this is something that's really important 
about the way research um, is being done nowadays. And this was all done in a coordinated effort in collaboration with other countries. And this has already been mentioned in the introduction that this was done as part of a massive global um, effort called the International Cancer Genome Consortium, uh, which is still uh, going and it's into its next phase of work. And it was uh, a coordination of over 75 projects um, that came together under harmonised conditions to share methods and data um, in order to understand the underlying genetics of many cancers around the world. And Australia was lucky uh, to have pancreatic cancer chosen as its cancer that was initially studied. And we uh, followed that up by looking at pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours and ovarian cancer. So where did we get up to with the APGI? Um, we have amassed a lot of data. We accumulated data on over 466 patients across Australia. We have made more than 3,000 data sets available to the research community with very minimal restrictions. And this is uh, the link to uh, the data portal that's made the data available. We have an enormous resource of biological samples and data. Hi, hi, Amber. I'm so sorry to interrupt again, but the slides don't seem to be changing um, as you're changing them on your screen. Is it all right if I just switch over to the other to the other slides for you? Would that be okay? Cool. Sorry about that. Is that is that okay then? Have you? Can you control those? Um, a bit. Sorry, everyone. I'm not sure what's happening. That's moving for me. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Okay. Let me just find where we're up to. Isn't it, isn't it incredible? We can sequence a genome, but we can't seem to uh, get the PowerPoint. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's all right. Okay. So just going back to the milestones, lots of data, lots of samples, and this is material from many patients, hopefully some who are sitting on this webinar, um, local patients recruited through the hospitals in Australia who um, bravely and altruistically donated their material and their medical information to help us understand more about pancreatic cancer. So, and this is also a, a major legacy um, because we've laid the foundation for further research. And it's safe to say that this knowledge that the ABGI is providing is underpinning a lot of the therapeutic development um, that's happening in the future. So let's walk through a little bit of the data. I'm gonna take you back now uh, to 2012. This was the first data set that was put out by the APGI. So this was our first set of 142 primary pancreatic cancers. And this was um, a big, uh, I would like to call um, the mother of all puzzle building exercises where we took all of these tumours and we analysed them deeply and we made a big puzzle and we looked at all the different parts and assembled them to try and work out how these uh, genetic faults were sitting. And um, we got more than we bargained for because we found over 2,000 genetic mutations, many we knew and a lot most we didn't know, including pathways or so a group of genes coming together to form a pathway. The biggest uh, learning points were that many of these were unique to individual cancers and that there were so many mutations, it was really difficult to know from this data set which were important. So we took this a step further in the next data set, and I apologise, um, my slides weren't working. This was a way for me to, to take you through the way we analyze some of this data, but I'll try and describe it as best I can. We looked in even more depth um, and used an even newer form of technology. So we looked at the whole genomes of these patients and we also coupled that with clinical data. So the past medical history of patients, their treatment responses and their outcomes. And we found that tumors in a high proportion of these patients have what we called unstable regions sitting inside those genomes. And these unstable regions uh, were really, um, were, could be used 
by existing classes of chemotherapy and made them vulnerable to these existing classes of chemotherapy. And this box, these are the chromosomes all around the outside. And this is called a circos plot. Um, I'll link, hopefully these will be all linked up for you to, to look at this in more depth. Um, and these are the faults at frequencies uh, inside each of the regions uh, of the chromosomes. So this was a really important finding because it almost told us that this was a way that we could use current treatments better. We were not discovering any new treatments, but it made us think about how we can use existing treatments better, which was really a major win for pancreas cancer. So this was the next uh, data set and probably the largest data set in pancreatic cancer to date. So this was also looking at the complete genetic makeup of tumors, the whole genomes. And as I mentioned, the most comprehensive picture yet of the genetics of pancreatic cancer. And we found that tumors could be grouped into four different subtypes. And these subtypes each had their own genetic makeup and distinct behavior. And these, what we call genomic subtypes, uh, potentially enriched for therapeutic vulnerabilities, so treatment targets, um, and these are undergoing further preclinical and clinical assessment uh, as we speak. And it really gave us um, the, the, the rest of the knowledge we needed to really affirm our thinking that pancreatic cancer is more than one disease. And this has been mirrored in the data a lot uh, since, and, and this is another study that, that took uh, a multitude of data sets. And, and we like to sort of call this the actionable genome. This is something that Dr. Pavlakis touched on. Um, there will be a percentage of patient tumors that we cannot find a target. There is no detectable target, but we have the slice of the pie here is broken up into all these individual phenotypes um, that have potentially targeted uh, treatments that, are, ex that exist today. So I won't be able to talk you through this slide uh, as well as I'd like to. And it's something that Dr. Pavlakis has already touched on. We're really looking at laying the foundation for personalized cancer care, where we take a population of patients, we subtype them and we look deeply at the genetics of their tumor and the genetics of their normal cells. Um, and we can find them and we can use genome sequencing and we can put them into groups that allow them to be targeted with individual therapies. And this is a way of looking at improving outcomes with current treatments. We still wanna discover new therapies. We want new targets for new drugs, but we also wanna know how to use current treatments better. And we also wanna be able to better select patients for clinical trials. So I'm going to talk you through um, a couple of new studies uh, for the next few slides um, and something that um, is data really hot off the press just over the last few weeks. Um, and we're looking at some individual groups of patients within the larger genome data set. And this is a specific study looking at long term survivors of pancreatic cancer. And this is uh, the goal of investigating patients with over five years survival post-surgery, and we're using molecular data, so using genome sequencing technologies, um, three different types, including a new type of sequencing, which many of you may have heard of, called single cell sequencing, where we're sequencing individual cells. And this is a, a really exciting new technology that's being adopted in many research labs. We're coupling that molecular data with detailed clinical data uh, and also looking at patients within the APGI that ha have, are still alive at this post five year mark, and also in collaboration with some colleagues uh, in the USA. And the rationale for this is that the pace of progression of disease and long-term survival is heterogeneous, and it's determined by biology rather than pathology alone. And pathology being the way we diagnose um, and prognosticate our cancers at the moment. We know that this isn't giving us the full story and that we really needed to look more deeply at this group of people. And there's a few hypotheses coming out. Um, we have three that we're really looking into at the moment, as I say, hot off the press. Um, and the first is about protective neoantigens. Um, and this is a, I haven't gone into too much uh, depth about this because this is a new project funded by the Stand Up to Cancer Foundation in the US 
in collaboration with our US colleagues. Um, there's the second hypothesis about um, extreme responses to adjuvant therapy, so therapy after surgery. Um, this is probably uh, the leading hypothesis at the moment and that we've already touched on immunotherapy a little bit, but the hypothesis that long-term survival um, has a different immune cell ecosystem to what we see in regular pancreatic cancers. And we hope that um, we'll be able to wrap this data up um, by the end of the year uh, and make this available. The second study is the AVNA Matrix Atlas Project, ATMA, another um, acronym for everybody to remember. If, if you haven't realized that already, we love our acronyms here in science. And this is a new and very exciting project, um, looking at things a little bit differently. And I, I present this on behalf of my colleagues, Paul Timpson and Brooke Pereira, who are my colleagues at the Garvin. Um, and they're looking at the extracellular matrices in pancreatic cancer. So this is like the scar tissue. And, and Dr. Pavlak has touched on the desmoplasia. So this is all the bits around the cancer in the cell, because we know that we have this extensive scarring when we look under the microscope at pancreatic cancers. But we also know that when we completely remove the stroma, this doesn't improve outcomes for patients. So there has to be something in between uh, that's going on uh, in this area. So the, the gap that this project is addressing is looking at how local spatially distinct changes in this matrix uh, tissue composition that's outside and around the tumour can influence the tumour development progression and eventual progression in pancreatic cancer. And this is a project that's in collaboration with Royal North Shore Hospital and the excellent um, clinical and translational teams they have. And here's the two uh, very clever young scientists that are working on this, uh, taking tumours um, fresh from surgery and the pathology lab, and then bringing them back to the research laboratory um, for processing and data analysis. So I'll conclude there, and I only had 15 minutes to give you a quick overview, but um, hopefully I've given you some, some ideas about how the information generated by the APGI is providing opportunity for discovery, but also development of new targets for cancer therapies. We have a long way to go. We need many steps to translate the research data into patient care. Um, but I agree with Dr. Pavlakis that we have made incremental gains and, and we really got to keep chipping away at this disease um, in order to, to get that eureka moment. And, and a couple of really important points that no single institution uh, has the critical mass to do all of this work. We can't work alone. We must work together. We must integrate all the disciplines that are required and that we really um, don't learn from as many patients as we should. And, and, and this is a little philosophical point that we really like to see a time when every patient journey um, builds the knowledge to accelerate new treatments and cures, not just patients who get onto clinical trials or have genome sequencing. So thank you, everybody. I will finish there. I'm happy to take a few questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, I think we just have time for one question. Um, and one of the questions that came through is, how long does it take for genomic testing? Uh, that will depend on the type of testing and where the testing is being done. It's, it's So a common way to look for uh, therapeutic targets is to do um, a, what we call a panel. So it's looking at a select range of genes and targets. And um, in many cases, this can be done in uh, a few days to a few weeks. Um, when I first started doing genomics, it used to take a month to generate a single genome. Um, and, and now it's, it's, it's really a lot quicker than that. So it really depends um, where it's being done and, and what's exactly being done. But it certainly can be done in a few days to, to, to a week these days. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Amber. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm now going to hand over to John. Um, Hello, so, Sophia. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And okay. I've just got your slides up. Thank you so much, Amber. And thanks, Professor Pavlak, um, Prof <laughs> Professor Zuckberg. No problem. 
Thanks, Sophia. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to uh, speak today. Um, I'm going to talk about something which is a little bit different, but I hope nevertheless, uh, nevertheless is of interest. And uh, that's about the role of uh, what we call clinical quality registries in helping to improve pa pancreatic cancer care and treatment. So what I'm going to discuss briefly are the principles underlying a clinical quality registry. Uh, everyone will have heard of registries. Um, New South Wales Cancer Institute has a registry. All the states have a registry. Victoria has one and so on. They tend to be registries that measure uh, how commonly a disease occurs, or in this case, a cancer occurs, and, and the mortality or survival from that cancer. Whereas what we're talking about is a registry or a data, a data set that actually measures quality of care. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about the upper gastrointestinal cancer registry, which has a focus on pancreatic cancer, and mention a grant that we we're very fortunate to receive from the Odena Foundation um, uh, just last year, in which um, we've, uh, I think, very innovative uh, concepts are being explored. So the next um, slide. Um, so I can advance this. So we all want to deliver, as clinicians, we all want to deliver evidence-based medicine. And in fact, um, of course, patients want to receive evidence-based medicine. So medicine that's, um, that we receive as patients that is based on high quality um, data that says that the treatment we're receiving is better than the treatment, than other treatments that might be offered. The problem, though, is that we don't always do it well for a variety of reasons, which I'll go through in a moment. So clinical quality registries provide an opportunity that actually um, starts to improve the delivery of evidence-based medicine and therefore quality of care to the benefit of patients, clinicians, and the health system overall. So we think of clinical quality registries or CQRs as a tool to measure and improve quality of care. So I don't know whether you can see a cursor, but in, in the orange box, um, I, we'll, we'll take for a moment for granted that there's considerable variation in care. And I'll go into explaining a bit more about that in a moment. So, and, and in fact, every uh, disease setting that I've been involved in over many years, whether it's cancer or non-cancer settings, there's always variation. But some of that, of course, is quite appropriate. We don't treat 20 year old people like 100 year old people when it comes to surgery, for example. So if we're going to understand about variation um, in, insofar as this determines the quality of care, then we need to measure it. If you don't measure quality, you don't know anything about what quality of care is being received. And then what we do is what, having measured quality of care, we benchmark uh, individual institutions, individual practices, even individual clinicians after risk adjustment. And that leads to improvements in quality. And, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. So the, the but it's a very important principle that we that we get our heads around is that given that there is variation, we need to start to uh, measure what quality of care has been delivered. And not, and not assume it's high quality, not assume it's low quality, but simply measure the quality of care. And by measuring it, we can start to say, how do, can we actually improve it? The important thing about a registry, though, and that's somewhat different from other types of data, is that there's very significant clinical engagement. And, and the beauty of a registry and the power of a registry is that it engages clinicians in wanting to understand the, the need for measurement and also driving improvements in their own quality of care. So the other thing that's really important, though, about a clinical quality registry is that it allows us an opportunity to ask a very important research question. And that research question, if there's variation in care, and we just take that as a given for a moment, how much of that variation is warranted or not? And as I mentioned, there may be plenty of examples where variation is very appropriate, and age differences in care, of course, are part of that. But what, So how much of it is warranted or unwarranted? What is the extent of unwarranted variation? We have no idea. Uh, we know about the trials that Nick mentioned and, and so forth, but those are trials that are done in very, very, um, very defined circumstances. But what's the extent of unwarranted variation in the real world? And these are real world data that we're collecting, not clinical trials. This is where everybody is part of these uh, data sets. 
And then finally, if there is unwarranted variation, what's the impact on that on patient outcomes? Because being able to show that back to clinicians, to show there's unwarranted variation, which they may not be aware of, and show them the impact of that on patient outcomes is the way that we can continue to drive improvements in, in practice and improvements in quality of care. So I said before that there's considerable variation. So why does that variation exist? Well, of course, as I mentioned, some of it can be expected, <clears throat> excuse me, or unwarranted, and some of it can be, or, so some can be expected and some can be unwarranted. But it, why would there be variation? And I think when you think about the evidence that supports the way we practice medicine, a lot of medicine is not necessarily evidence-based. There aren't that many trials, and nor should there be necessarily, where we've done randomized trials of surgery versus no surgery, for example. It's taken as a given, as an axiom, that surgery is the right thing to do for early pancreas cancer. And I think the data support that. But there are lots of other areas in the practice of medicine and the practice of oncology where the evidence doesn't exist. And if there's no evidence, then you wouldn't be surprised to hear or understand that clinicians do different things because they base it on their experience, they base it on their last case, but actually the evidence to guide them isn't there. On the other hand, sometimes the evidence is not accepted or the evidence is weak or, they, or clinicians say, this isn't my practice. And as we've heard through Amber, a lot of trials only represent five or 10% of patients that are eligible for a, with a particular condition. So only five or 10% of patients end up on trials. And, and so clinicians may sometimes look at the results of these trials and say, the trial's fine, but I can't give my patient that treatment because my patient's sicker or older or more frail. And the other thing that's an unfortunate fact of life is that evidence, even when it exists, even when it's strong, takes a long time to implement. Some people have estimated it up to 17 years for things that are shown by trials or shown by other forms of research to be best practice for them to be implemented uh, routinely and in a widespread manner. Sometimes there are other incentives for certain practices to continue or to start or to stop and that we need to acknowledge that. And of course, change is always difficult. So when we say, well, we want to practice best, um, you know, we want to practice um, best care, we want to deliver optimal, um, optimal care or best practice, how do we define that? How do we decide what that is? Uh, is that my opinion? Is it Nick's opinion? How do we do that? And the way we decide what, um, what that is, is basically starting to look at international guidelines, uh, national guidelines, and as I mentioned, where there isn't a lot of evidence, look at getting some sort of clinical consensus, including views, of course, from consumers. But what's important here is not just that we look at these guidelines and, um, and, and, and achieve clinical consensus, but what's important to recognize is that we're engaging clinicians in the process of deciding and agreeing of what is best practice, which means that when we show them their data, they're not going to say to us, well, that's not what we should do. We believe we should do something else. That's not the case because the process of defining what's best, what's evidence-based, best practice, involve them in the first place. So there is an understanding that this is where we, this is the pinnacle of what we're trying to achieve. The clinicians broadly accept, and now we are going to measure with these quality indicators, we're going to measure our compliance against that best practice standard. And that's really how you measure quality of care and how you start to say, um, what where there's variation how is that variation against this this gold standard um so uh, this is the uh, uh, slide that's uh, been borrowed partly from the australian commission for safety and quality in healthcare it talks about what this process involves so data are collected in the registry they're cleaned and analyzed and benchmarking occurs and then these reports are provided back to uh, individual institutions and then there's an understanding about outliers, and I'll show you what I mean by an outlier in a moment. Many of the times when we do see unwarranted variation, I know I'm focused on the individual clinician, but actually uh, mostly these are system level issues. These are not bad clinicians who are trying to do the wrong thing, but quite the contrary. 
um, one of the indicators, for example, in pancreas cancer is that all patients should be presented at a multidisciplinary meeting. Well, if your meeting is only occurring every two weeks or every month, or there isn't a meeting, then you can't present them at a multidisciplinary meeting. So it's a system issue in relation to access to the MDT, not so much an individual clinician perf uh, performance issue. So within the um, um, uh, upper GI can or the uh, upper gastrointestinal cancer registry, we created when we first started, we created four modules. This was to try and make it easier to uh, advance this uh, registry project through ethics committees and, and uh, around, around Victoria and around Australia. Uh, it, we started, in fact, with the pancreatic cancer module and currently includes over 2,800 participants. But we also have a module that deals with uh, cancers of the esophagus and stomach, uh, a, a module which deals with uh, cancers of the bile duct, and uh, a module which hasn't started yet, which is um, concerned with pa uh, primary tumours of the liver, so called he he hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's in a uh, pro project development phase. These are, I don't, this is a very busy slide, and I don't mean that you should uh, read any of it, but rather just to explain, to give you a sort of snapshot of what clinicians uh, will receive. So they will receive these um, uh, reports, um, which will show, will show some of their data, and I'll show you an example in a moment, which show that the data of, of, of a particular indicator where we measure compliance um, against the standard for that particular institution. And here's what one of these plots looks like. So if I go back for a moment, um, th this is what we call a funnel plot. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. And now I'm showing you a funnel plot in uh, uh, enlarged. And what you can see here is that uh, this is patients discussed at an MDM, at a multidisciplinary meeting. This is the number of patients. And as you can see, uh, most of the, the, each one of these black dots is an individual institution. But if you're a clinician at health service, I work at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, if you're a clinician at the Alfred Hospital, then uh, and this is an Alfred Hospital report, then I know where my health service fits in this um, benchmarking exercise. And I can see that I'm pretty close to the mean, but um, here's an outlier. And you can see this outlier is actually doing very well. So a greater percentage of patients in this institution, I don't know which institution it is, but a greater percentage of patients are presented at an MDT than they are, say, at my own health service, even though the number of patients is quite large. And here's a poor outlier where there are very few patients being presented at an MDT um, for a smaller number of patients, well, actually a similar number of patients to my health service. So what you can see here is that the benchmarking exercise, uh, um, which, which uh, often occurs after you've adjusted for age and other factors like that uh, allows you to determine um, where you sit in relation to your peers. Uh, it also allows you to, to identify positive outliers and negative outliers. And it's a room of clinicians sitting around a table and looking at these data and asking themselves, why are we in this poor performance outlier? That drives change. It's, you call it peer review, you call it competitive spirit, you can call it anything you like, this drives change, and we've seen it time and time again. Um, secondly, that, uh, I just wanted to move on now and um, uh, show you a little bit of data which is unpublished, which is where we're trying to say, well, if quality of care is what we're aiming for, what's the relationship between quality of care and clinical outcomes? We all want high quality care. Nobody wants anything different to that. But do I have a better outcome if I receive high quality care? And we did this within a subgroup of patients within the pancreatic module of the upper GI cancer um, registry. And we looked at uh, 1,154 patients, as you can see in this figure. And there were six quality indicators that actually um, uh, correlated with outcomes for patients. Some of these uh, showed high compliance and some of them showed low compliance. So for example, in patients who may be suitable for surgery, um, optimal practice or best practice is that they receive a specific, um, especially a special type of CT scan or MRI scan in order to assess their surgical, um, whether or not they're suitable for surgery. And we found, for example, in that case, that it only occurred in 68% of patients. 
And this actually correlates. So if you didn't have the scan, these scans, then outcomes were worse. Um, here's another one. So these are the low compliance ones that I'm focusing on for a moment. These are patients discussed at a multidisciplinary meeting. Only 65% of patients um, of the cohort we looked at were actually presented at a multidisciplinary meeting in order to plan care. So, you know, obviously there is room for improvement here. On the other hand, when we look at the use of adjuvant chemotherapy or additional chemotherapy after surgery, or a reason documented for not taking treatment, there was a high compliance of 94%. Uh, this is just to give you a feel for the indicators that we collect and the fact that we then started to ask the question, which of these indicators relates to outcome? And because uh, and, and, they are obviously the ones that were more important to uh, focus on in terms of improving quality of care. So these are the uh, six indicators. I won't go through them all again, but they're listed here and I'm, I'm sure the slides will be available. The other thing that the registry is a fantastic resource for is additional research. And I, again, I won't go through all of these in, in detail, but there are a number of research projects, including grants from National Health and Medical Research Council, the Victorian Cancer Agency, and so on, um, including a cancer biobank, which means that we can actually not only look at samples in the way that Amber described, but we can also start to ask about the implication of certain genetic mutations in terms of outcome. So these are all the types of research projects that we have built off the, uh, the pancreatic module. Um, and I won't, as I say, I don't want to go through them in detail, but I just want to mention one in particular, and which so we were very fortunate to receive funding from the Abner Pancreatic Cancer Foundation to look at uh, international practice uh, when we're comparing uh, assessment of surgical uh, resection. Um, and I, I used to go to meetings all over the world and often come back and, and, and have the sense that um, surgery in Europe in particular and sometimes in the US was much more aggressive than what we were seeing being done in Australia. And, uh, and, and patients that we might think were not operable, not suitable for operations, were actually having surgery. And we do know that patients receiving surgery um, successfully will have a better outcome. And so this study was really designed to uh, almost a multidisciplinary, uh, sorry, an international MDT, where we would have surgeons from the US or from Europe and Australia looking at these images in an image, in an image bank or an image biobank um, and actually start to compare their results and their assessments um, of whether or not patients had, uh, were suitable for surgery. The study, um, these are the aims of the study, as I say, we're very um, pleased to have been funded by the Avner Foundation. Um, and um, these are the aims that we went through. It's only a pilot study with only 100 patients, but to give us a feel for with, um, with, whether or not this is an important area of investigation, to our knowledge, not one that's been done before. So we identified registrants, uh, participants from the registry. We copied the CT image files across to the university. Uh, in a free imaging platform uh, software. Uh, we de-identified cases, of course, um, and then ultimately link it to the data we collect. At, at the moment, we've got um, the upload processes are in place, the survey instruments are designed, the platform's been developed. We're starting to recruit uh, clinicians and within the next month or so, we hope to start uh, a pilot study at the Alfred. These are the sites that are involved in this study. So we're very excited to work with major sites around Australia, uh, essentially around Victoria and New South Wales. Needless to say, COVID has, has um, had some impact on this, but we, uh, we are moving along as uh, quickly as we can. So this is my uh, summary slide, uh, just to say that a clinical quality registry, such as the upper GI cancer registry is an important um, means of measuring variation in quality of care and outcomes. <clears throat> the reporting of quality of care and benchmark reports to institutions engages clinicians and patients and health services in the measurement and improving of quality relative to, relevant to their own practice and as a result can lead to improvements in care. The registry is a key asset for related research funding. Um, am I running out of time, Sophia? I've just got a few more points. So, oh, no, no, please continue. <laughs> Okay, so the registry is a key asset for related research, including the uh, investigation of the extent and impact of unwarranted variation. Um, it's a, uh, we can do registry-based clinical trials and of course other research that I've mentioned. And, 
uh, as mentioned, the Avena Pancreatic Cancer Foundation innovation grants made it possible to study whether there are international differences in the approach to surgery in patients with pancreatic cancer. And finally, I'd like to conclude just by acknowledging um, the many um, participants and their families who, who have been involved in the registry. We've got lots of investigators at, site all, at sites all over Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, we have a very uh, fabulous team in, in um, uh, running the registry from the, um, at, at Monash and uh, in New South Wales as well. Um, and um, of course, I'd like to also thank very much our funders, which include the Victorian government, NHMRC, and of course, the Avno Pancreatic Cancer Foundation. Thank you very much for, your, uh, for listening. And I'd certainly be happy to uh, answer any questions, Sophia. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. So um, I think we've got time maybe for one question. Um, and uh, one of them is, how can patients take this valuable information from the registry and sort of about quality care and, and really sort of help apply that to their to their own experiences? So at the moment, um, so it's a good question. Uh, at the moment, the uh, we're just starting to get to the point where we report data back to clinicians. Um, however, uh, within the next six to 12 months, for example, we'll, we'll start to produce public reports um, uh, in the form usually of annual reports. At this point in time, there isn't um, public or, or transparent reporting of individual institutions, for example, but I do think that there are registries in lots of different tumor types. And I think that patients can ask their doctors, are they involved in the registries, which are essentially real world data collections? Are there lessons to be learned? Are there things that um, uh, that have been done at the institution to help or and so forth? So I think like all these sorts of issues, uh, the, the registries take a while to mature. And until that occurs, um, the, the patients patients will not easily be able to access the sort of information we're talking about other than in the scientific literature, I mean. But we are providing resources to patients through some of the trials in the pancreatic module. Um, uh, we're doing a study of, of collecting symptoms from patients and collecting quality of life. So, um, you know, some of this relates to where patients are treated, but increasingly, particularly in New South Wales, but increasingly in Victoria, there are very skilled people involved in the management of patients with pancreatic cancer and those um, clinicians will be aware of the registry uh, and aware of the opportunities that come from being involved in the registry. That's really helpful thank you so much and um, I just want to say thank you for everybody for submitting your questions as well unfortunately we don't have time to get to them all but um, we'll try to get back to you after the webinar this evening. Um, thank you so much, Professor Zalkberg, for your presentation no tonight. No um, and thank you. And uh, I'd also just like to say a huge thank you to all of our presenters for taking the time out this evening and also for everybody for attending our webinar. It's really great to see all the progress that has been made in pancreatic cancer research. And Avner Foundation will continue to support and work towards seeing further advances in the future. So we hope to see you all at our next webinar and uh, thank you and I hope you all have a good evening.